thank you, um, <coughs> Jeremy. And um, I, I really must thank ODI, DFID, and um, Practical Action Publishers for, for making this occasion possible. Um, I'm, I'm quite thrilled that it's happening. And congratulations to Jeremy on having brought this child to birth. I've been a I mean, as you you have you actually used the word um, bully, but you did pre you did you you did prefix it by saying good-natured bullying. <laughs> <laughs> but we have a committee on bullying in IDS, and I'm very worried that they might they might um, <laughs> read your your preface. Um, but it, it's 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 been it's been some time, but it's it's brilliant that it's now out um, because I think it gives us something very very solid. Um, to build on, to go, to analyze, and to build on. Um, but just before I start, can I ask who, who we are in the room? I mean, just to get some sort of general idea. Um, who's from an NGO? And who's from DFID? <laughs> that's a lot. That's, that's great. Um, brilliant. Who's from, uh, uh, who's freelance? And who is, works with a consultancy company? And who have I missed? Academics. Academics. <laughs> <laughs> who are academic researchers? Right. Well, we've got a wonderful. And anybody else? No, that's more or less it. Um, we've got a wonderful, a wonderful mix of people, and I think that this will will pay off a lot when we get to the technical discussion later. Um, I think that what we've got here is a methodological breakthrough. It's been around for some time, but it's really not been recognized and it certainly has never become mainstream and one of the hopes of with this book I think must be that um, this will become much more mainstream because of the win-wins that um, Jeremy has articulated so so clearly going through the book and um, of course I would recommend that you get it um, but g going through the book there's a considerable range of examples in the different chapters. There's 3D modeling, there's geospatial mapping, there's morbidity and mortality maps, which led to changes of policy which saved lives very quickly in the Philippines. Um, there's participatory sustainability indicators, which took three weeks to identify from farmers, with farmers in Malawi, but which then led to insights which shocked agricultural scientists because farmers' priorities were very, very different from what they had supposed would be good for them, particularly over agroforestry. Um, there are three cases of participatory impact assessment in here. Um, there's the, the question of food security status in a government program, and there's the example of Ubudehi from Rwanda by Ashish Shah, who's now working with uh, DFID in, in um, Malawi which I, I'll come on to in a moment. Could I, could I just show the, um, the, the, the piggies quickly? Oh, <laughs> I, need a, I need a lesson. Huh? <laughs> which one do you press? Uh, oh, well, we've yeah, started anyway. Oh, all right, I mean, the, the, point of, the point of this one is simply to illustrate group visual synergy, that when a lot of people are participating and you can observe this happening, you can see that they are trying to get things right. They are cumulatively building up a visual picture of the reality, and, and, and Jeremy's just illustrated that very well. Well, I pressed the green one. Um, that shouldn't be the next one. This is the next one. Um, this is what Jeremy mentioned as group visual synergy. This is what, what, what happens, and this is where the, if you like, the rigor some of the rigor comes out of these processes because the outsider convenes, facil initiates, facilitates, and then watches. And then the process very often takes off. How many people have had this sort of experience in, in the room? A lot of, it's really a lot of, there's a lot of experience of this, this phenomenon in the room. So you'll know very much what I'm talking about. But there's a cross-checking. And because it's visual and tangible, people can see what's being said. It's, it's, it's much more verifiable than anything which is said verbally. And this is an advantage that the visual and the tangible has when it gets to rigor and, 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 and it gets to questions of, of, of accuracy. 
So that is what group visual synergy is. This is simply a map, and you can see this on the wall as well. I've, I've stuck some things up on the wall. This is a map which becomes, in fact, a bit not only a village census, but a, a village inventory of various things which different people have. And this is from, from Sri Lanka. And there are many, many cases of this. Who has facilitated participatory mapping in the room? It's, again, it's a lot, of, a lot of people. And this is the sort of thing which can come out. This was, in fact, in 1992, in 130 villages mapping um, by ActionAid in Nepal to identify who were receiving different services. There are 13 um, diagrams like this. One of them, which has the population, comes out at 36,000. But it all came off maps, um, which were done in a participatory way in the different communities. This, again, is up on the wall if you want to look at it, but it's this point about putting numbers on qualitative change. This was thrashed out between a group of women who did it separately and a group of men who did it separately um, in India. And it's the 10 seed technique. So the two left-hand columns add sum to 10, the two right-hand columns sum to 10. And there's 10 years ago now, which you, you can see. But what this shows is what their judgment was in putting a score by making comparisons of the social change, the changes in gender relations and gender roles which had taken place over the 10-year period. And something from which they learn a lot as well. Now, this is actually Carlos. This is this is in your paper, um, <laughs> isn't it? Um, this is in Carlos's paper. This, and correct me, Carlos, if I get it wrong. But this this was a, a very um, a very clever w way, really, of identifying who was getting a government program and who wasn't. It was meant to be for the poorest. And what they did, if I've got it right, is that people classified themselves by food security status. And then there was a list which showed who'd received. And you simply put those two together. Is that right, Carlos? More or less? I'm sure there was more cross-checking and, and so on, <laughs> knowing it was Carlos. But, um, but, but what, it, what it shows very clearly, and pretty credibly, I think, <coughs> uh, is who was getting um, and who was not getting and how misdirected the, the, um, the, the recipients were. And um, the last one is this extraordinary case of Rwanda. And Rwanda is up there um, <coughs> under participatory trend analysis over there. In Rwanda, over five years, there was a process called Ubudehi, which is recounted in this book by Ashish, uh, because he was involved in it, in which people made maps which are on cloth, so they're permanent maps, which they keep in their communities. And these maps have got a lot of data on individual households. <coughs> Among other things, they classified uh, people in six wealth categories, and those are recorded on these maps. Now, this is across the whole of Rwanda now. It's covered almost 15,000, uh, all, all the com communes, co colleagues, I think they're called, which, um, which is the whole of the rural, uh, the whole of rural Rwanda. And the data is now being used by the Ministry of Health. Uh, they've set up a unit and they're using the data from these maps to identify who um, should receive uh, certain programs. And the Ministry of Education, I'm not sure how far they've got, but they were certainly intending to make use of this data as well. So this is on a national scale, using um, participatory data generated and kept on maps, and according to the reports, but this needs to be verified, updated periodically by people in the community as things change. And you'll see some changes there in participatory trend analysis. That's from the Ubudehi program, and it's in the book here. Um, that's, I think, the end of... Now, <coughs> some, some quick observations. The first, the point about being able to quantify, to put numbers, people put numbers on things which normally are considered to be qualitative. That is a point that Jeremy has made very clearly, so I won't labor it any further. 
Another thing which is a bit surprising is that it seems to be possible to use these approaches um, on sensitive subjects that you might not be able to cover with a questionnaire. And I see that Dee, who, who's done a lot of this, <coughs> Dee is, is, is quietly nodding. So maybe this is something which comes up later, but I, I don't need to deal with it. Things to do with, with, um, with, ge with gender relations, um, things to do with corruption, things to do with the police, things like this can, can all come out in a group when the individuals may be uh, timid um, or reluctant. And then there's the question of, of rigor. And I would like to refer you to um, this document, which you can download from the Feinstein um, International Center, um, which is really, really good on issues around uh, rigor and, um, and, and how to assure it, and also on issues around triangulation. Because it's not just successive approximation, but it's also triangulation between different sources, which can be part of these processes, which can end up with data which has got a credibility. Um, I mean, I'm a biased witness, obviously, but I really do genuinely think it has a credibility which you don't get and can't expect to get with a questionnaire survey. Now, <coughs> if what Jeremy has been saying and what I've been saying um, has some substance to it, and if what this book is saying and providing evidence for has got some substance to it, the big, big question which I think should confront all of us, and I want to really throw this out as a challenge, the big question is why, why is it that this has not taken off and taken on? Now, we've, we've seen the win-win, that it's got the rigor of both paradigms, if you like, the participatory, adaptive, emergent paradigm and the statistical paradigm. It's got a dual, dual rigor interlocking there. So that's a thing in its, in its favor. But <laughs> why is it when people see this and they say, yes, I agree, that they don't then actually do something about it. Jeremy, Carlos, and I had quite a long session with the 25 statisticians, statos, I believe you call them. Is that right? <laughs> well, that, that's a term, well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, they, 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 they were identified by the, by the social development advisors as statos. But there were 25 of them, and there were 60 social development advisors, and they were having a retreat for three, for three days. And we made this presentation, or more, more than we're going to be able to today. And they said, yes, you know, this is really, really good, and, and we must go and we must start implementing this. Now, it may be that some of them have, but my guess is that hardly any of them have done anything about it. Now, this is not a criticism, because they're part of a whole system which makes it difficult for them, perhaps, to innovate. Because they're involved in, in funding, they have business as usual, they don't have very much time, and there are issues about taking risks. There's a shortage of facilitators and innovators around the world. There is no shortage of people who can carry out questionnaire surveys. So if you need a study which generates number, the obvious and easy, safe thing to do is to go to an institution and say, can you do this? Um, and they say yes, and they produce a questionnaire, and it becomes a questionnaire. It's a reflex. It's very deeply embedded rut. And to get out of it requires a great deal of courage. It requires time. It requires vision. Um, and it requires some, some, the courage is related really to risk taking. But it does particularly require, require time. So the question is, where do we go, where do we go from, from here? Is this another meeting at which people will say, hmm, yes, yes, you know, and then nothing happens? That's what I'm afraid of, because there seems to be a recurrence of meetings like this where everybody says, hmm, yeah, hmm, hmm, and then nothing happens. <laughs> well, let me, let, me, let me tell you what I think 
what, what I think we need to go forward. I mean, this, let me throw these out as questions. The first is to support innovations, and that's looking to the future. And this is particularly with ICTs. There are lots of interesting and important statistical questions around crowdsourcing, for instance. And a lot is being done. A lot is happening very, very rapidly. And we need people who make it their job to find out what's going on and what can be learned and what can be made accessible to other people in terms of the lessons learned and the methods which um, are arising. A second thing, that's one thing, innovation. The second thing that we need, I think, is for an understanding that if there is going to be a participatory approach, generating participatory statistics, the people who are entrusted with it, who should be innovators to the extent possible, they need time to develop the method and the approach for the particular context. In the case of one study in, that, I, that I know about in, um, in, in, in Malawi, it was, I think it was an ODI study, um, some, some time back, a team of three people spent three weeks in the field with, with farmers brainstorming. It was a sustainability study that I mentioned earlier three weeks developing the, the methodology. But when they got the methodology, when they got the categories and the indicators that farmers themselves wanted, then the rest went quickly. And that, I think, is the common experience. You, t you need more time and patience at the beginning, which means you need guts. And you need, you need vision. You need, if you're a funder, you need the vision to realize that you've got to allow time for this to be developed well. And then things will go uh, very often much faster. And the other thing that funders particularly need to understand is that they need to provide time and to factor in time with consultants. Factor in time for writing it up and sharing it. Because if you're making your living as a freelance, it's difficult to say, I'm going to take a month now in order to write this up. But of course, nobody is paying me for doing this. It's, it's really not reasonable to expect people to do that. So what I would urge is that funders who are funding these types of innovations, that they would allow time, they would factor in time for writing it up in a form that can be shared um, with other people. The third thing it needs is champions. As with any innovation of this sort, it needs people who see the potential and who really um, fight for it, and sometimes fighting against um, the odds. And the last thing that I think is needed, and this is perhaps much more, um, I don't know whether it's more or less likely to happen, but I think that it would be wonderful if we had an organization which was dedicated to participatory statistics. The Statistical Services Center in Reading almost managed to do this, but there was a lack of demand for your courses. You would, they, they ran. You ran courses, didn't you? They ran courses for about three years, but then there was a lack of demand for them, and so they had to, s to stop that. So there's no, as far as I know, there is no website anywhere in the world which you can go to, I mean, if anyone can correct me, please do, where you can go to for participatory statistics. It just doesn't exist. Does it? No. no. So... <laughs> <laughs> Not even um, ours. Uh, so... so could there be an organization? There may be somebody in this room here who would have an idea of an organization. There's the possibility also of the German Institute um, for Independent Development Evaluation, whose, um, whose director has endorsed this Helmut Asher, an extremely rich compendium, he says about the book, completing and correcting conventional statistical and evaluative practice. And that is coming from the head of an evaluation organization with about 70 or 80 staff now in, in Germany. So it, maybe they will pick it up. I don't know. But somebody somewhere should pick it up. And the other thing that we need, which is not in the book, but the other thing that we need really, really badly is a practical guide that any of us can pick up, which will explain to us what can be done and how we can do it and what the pitfalls are and what the strengths are and so on. A practical guide. And we haven't got that yet. So that's my challenge to you. Somebody do something. <laughs>
Thanks very much indeed, Jeremy and Robert. I'm going to move straight on to the discussants now. To get a bit of time for discussion, I'd be it'd be really great if you could keep yourself to five minutes so that we can um, get through. Carlos, do you want to start? Because you've got okay. a foot in both camps. Well, you've got a chapter you. in the book, <laughs> and you're a discussant. Thank you very much. 